When I was in high school, I could read a fantasy novel in what felt like minutes, and then forget the homework I did the night before as soon as I walked into the classroom. I always loved literature, and I considered myself pretty good at writing my own creative pieces. One night, during the end of my junior year, my mother came downstairs at the witching hour to find me sitting at the computer, sobbing, because I couldn't figure out how to start be and begin my research paper. Starting in elementary school, teachers found their own labels for me. Talented, but lazy. She'd do so well if she would just hand in her assignments on time. Extremely disorganized. One of my brothers and my favorite was wasted potential. Maybe you or people you care about have had these labels applied to them. Maybe you've labeled people as such. It's easy to dismiss students' strengths when their weaknesses seem so insurmountable. It's easy to dismiss them in ourselves. When my mother found me crying at the computer that night, even after transferring me from public to private school, we knew we had to seek more help, that much more had to change. We were referred to a certified school psychiatrist for educational testing. He ran me through 16 hours or so of these, this educational testing so that we could find out the specifics of how I learned what I needed to do in order to succeed. But not everyone can afford private school with sympathetic teachers or a certified school psychiatrist, or even conceive of them as options. So what I want to do tonight is to give you some steps you can take today, now, in the next few days, whether that be for you as a learner, an educator, a parent, or some combination, by telling you about my own experiences and the decisions I made in order to succeed. My learning difference begins with executive functioning, organizational skills, and a processing difference. By processing, I mean that I tend to internalize and absorb information at a slower rate than what we would consider the average person's processing speed to be. I can read something and write something and say something, even though I tend to talk pretty fast and can think on the spot, but I can't delve into deeper analysis. In the worst case scenario, you could ask me what I just read or studied or written or, or have written, but I wouldn't be able to recall a single detail from something I read seconds, minutes, hours before. So how do you trick your own brain? If your brain tells you, yep, you got this, you're 100% ready to go, then how do you know your brain is wrong? Well, let me tell you something. The way your brain tells you things isn't you. The way you're wired isn't you. The only thing that makes up the you-ness is itself, the you-ness, the you that you decided you wanted to accept and be. Maybe you said to yourself, my learning differences and the way I learn does not define me. Or maybe you say it factors into my personality and led me to where I am today. Or maybe you're somewhere in between or some combination of these two. But what I would like to do is to show you that it's not you that, or your learning difference that makes you you, it's the acceptance of yourself that both these mindsets or any of these mindsets require certain knowledge and acceptance of knowing that you learn differently from the way everyone around you seems to learn. But acceptance takes time, so we'll use my remaining minutes to talk about some steps you can take. First, self-assess. Think about your basic strengths. What are you good at? What do you enjoy? Can you write word games or logic puzzles really quickly? Do you enjoy reading, telling, listening to stories? Are you an athlete? That sort of thing. Remember those strengths and use them. Next, more basics. Think about your weaknesses or what you perceive as weaknesses. Mine is maybe my ADHD. I tend to lose focus on something pretty quickly, especially if I'm not interested in it. But if I am interested in something like narrative-based storytelling, then I can do really well. On the other hand, math doesn't interest me. It tends to elude me. I find it too abstract. There's no story. There's no flow. So what can I do then if I'm interested in reading a book and not writing a math equation? So I turn to st step two, which is to put up your defenses. 
Now, I don't mean get defensive and refuse to admit you have weaknesses to anyone. We'll get to the telling people part, don't worry. I think of it as a turn-based strategy game where you have a field of units and soldiers that are yours to command, and you have the bigger, bulkier, tougher soldiers that can take out an enemy in one fell swoop. And then you have the slightly squishier soldiers, like the mages, who can really pack a punch if they're set in the right terrain, but on their own, they're gonna get taken out. So you pair the tougher soldiers with the squish soldiers, so that the tough defends the squish, but the squish still get experience points and level up. It's cheesy, but it works in video games and it'll work in real life. Third, and perhaps my most important step, is to talk, reach out. Don't be afraid or ashamed. Tell your teachers, your parents, your students. Let them know that you've thought about the basics and the way that you learn and perhaps what you can do to balance out your strengths and weaknesses. Because if you let them know that you know yourself, it'll be easier to let other people know you too. Don't be afraid or ashamed. Now, where teachers are concerned, let your students know when you're available for non-judgmental learning specialty conversation. Many students are new to the concept of office hours, or maybe leery of coming to a teacher for outside help. The best thing you can do is to let them know right off the bat that you're available for these non-judgmental talks and accommodations. It doesn't have to be a big deal. You don't have to scream at the start of class. And for those of you with uh, learning differences, just open the door, start the conversation, show respect, normalize these talks, reinforce the normality, because learning outside the average range of learning methods is something that everyone needs to know and something students especially need to be reminded of. Fourth, take initiative. Try your learning methods and your new support system by applying them to less pressing tasks? Can you find a place to store the clutter in your room by or designing something artistic, by using your artistic talent to make a new organizational model? Can you write a thousand word short story or essay as if it were a mathematical proof? If you can, or if you can't, you've learned something. Take low risk trial and error. If you can and if, you wor if it works or if it doesn't work, and if you feel productive or if you don't feel productive, then you'll be able to find out how you learn. I call the fifth step motivate. Hopefully, once you've reached this step, you'll be motivated to accept your learning differences and see that you can change things and change your interests so that it better fits your learning environment. But it's a process even in this final step. Maybe once you reach this step, you'll realize that you need to self-assess again or follow the other steps, but this time a little differently. Maybe before you thought reality is simply reality. Life requires a certain adhering to the status quo that I may or may not fit, and that comes with the territory of the work or study place. But now, self-motivated, you're willing to see that it's not you or your learning habits that need to change. It's your mindset. Maybe you've even changed the status quo so that it fits you and your strengths. But all of this is pretty abstract without an example. So I will turn to my own story. And it's a math story and a game design story because if you can't tell, that's sort of my interest. And I'll tell you how I use these steps to make what I think is a pretty cool card game. First, I thought about what I was good at, writing and reading. I liked those things. I also liked King Lear, so I figured for my final game design project, which is a course I took, I would make a King Lear-inspired card game. Downside, game design requires a decent amount of math. I am not very good at math. Like I said, it's too abstract. So how could I make myself interested in this? So I turned to step two and I tried to balance my King Lear interest with the math. So I need three players, and I want there to be 54 cards to a deck, and there's going to be five types of cards for the players, and then there's going to be a non-player nature character of King Lear who will also have five cards. Uh-oh, I thought to myself, now I was interested in the math aspect. So if I was interested in the King Lear aspect and the math aspect, how could I balance them when I only understood one of them. 
So I turned to step three and I reached out to my math TA for the course. He started telling me something about uh, constrained value settings and I remember holding up my hand to stop him and saying, can you teach it to me in a different way? I am good at logic puzzles, not math. Can you teach this to me as if it were a story? I half expected him to say, while shrugging maybe, well, game design requires a decent amount of this abstract math stuff you don't like. Maybe you're just not cut out for this. But instead he said, okay, if you were going to take a stained glass window and paint it with a limited amount of colors, and you wanted to have it so that no window pane touched the same pane of the same color, which pane would you paint first, and what color would it be? Here we go to step four, applying these learning methods and support system to a low-risk environment like colors and windows. Oh, I said, you would paint the one in the middle because it touches everything, and you would paint it the amount you had least of. Exactly, he said. Now you understand constrained value settings. So we're going to take a card that affects all the other cards, and we're going to see which card is the most powerful of these ma this map of cards, and we're going to assign a value to it, let's call it X, and so on and so forth, until, wow, we had an equation that equaled 54 cards. We plugged the values into a calculator, and he said, okay, you're good to go. I didn't try doing it on my own. So we plugged them in, we got an equation. It's a little less scary than I'd feared. It's that one in bold at the bottom, if you can see it. Uh, but it's pretty simple. So now the rest was up to me. I had figured out what I was good at. I had reached out to my teacher. I had balanced my strengths and weaknesses and we had found an alternative and now it was on me. So I made a game that worked. I got an A in the course and on the project. I put it in my portfolio and something that would ordinarily have sent me into a panic was now taken notice of by schools in California in my portfolio. This summer I'm going to be working as a summer research uh, assistant at one of these game design labs. And it wasn't because I tried accepting the math for its own merits. I didn't try fitting myself into a certain expected category. Now, this is just an example, but I hope you see how the process works and you can apply it to your own lives and create your own anecdotes. It, there's nothing shameful about learning these, these steps and these processes because there's nothing shameful about knowing yourself and the way you work. Self-assess, defend, talk, experiment, motivate. When you learn the way you learn, you'll be on the road to self-acceptance. Thank you.